How is this coronavirus different than the pandemics we have seen in the past? Have we learned anything? Have the events like polio and the Spanish flu taught us anything to help us prepare for today? I sat down with Greg Lemke from the Salk Institute to find out more. Hi, Greg, good to see you and thank you for your time. My pleasure. We have been talking about coronavirus, coronavirus, COVID now for the past several weeks. I'd like to say that I think people understand it and they have been understanding it over the past few weeks, but given what we've been doing this for staying at home for almost a month now, there's still a lot of questions about coronavirus in sure. basic layman's terms for those that just need to hear what is happening right now. What's happening right now is we have this virus. This virus is a very tiny, small particle. It's basically a bag, a membrane bag with, D, with RNA instructions inside how to make other viruses. And that virus is living in people. And it's moving from person to person. It's infecting people by that mechanism. Um, you know, they're very bizarre things, viruses. They're basically, they're not living things on their own. Right? They can only live by infecting a cell, hijacking that cell's machinery to make more viruses. So that's what we're living with right now, is the, is the effects of the fact that the virus is contagious. So if one person have it, has it, they can easily give it to somebody else. A few months ago, if you would have asked the average person, could you imagine that we would have been in a time where they're asking you to stay at home and, and to wear a mask, people would say no. We haven't right. seen anything. Right. Most people have not seen anything like this uh, in their lifetime. You study this. And now when we watch media and the news, we, we're hearing about polio again. We're hearing about the Spanish flu, H1N1, all these things that really have been happening right. over the years. How is this different than what has been happening and kind of happens every few years? Yeah, it's basically something we are confronted with every few years. The problem with this thing, everybody calls this virus the novel coronavirus because it's new. So it's a new virus that we haven't seen before. It's very closely related to the SARS virus of about 15, 17 years ago. So it's a very close first cousin of that virus. But basically, we've been, we've been dealing with this, these kinds of issues of the infections every year we have. And we have them with flu. We had it in the past with, with, with pandemics, other pandemics. You know, in human history, we've confronted this multiple times. You know, smallpox is caused by a virus. It used to be a horrible disease that killed millions upon millions of people. We basically eliminated that disease with, with vaccinations. Um, and polio was a similar thing in the early 20th century. We started having polio epidemics in the summertime in here in North America, starting about the beginning of the 20th century. And then we had them every few years, there would be a recurrence. They kept getting worse and worse and worse until we developed the polio vaccine in the 1950s. And that has basically eradicated polio from the planet. So we have dealt with it with, in the past. I mean, what we're facing here now in terms of this shutdown is really unprecedented. Though. We've never been in a situation like this before. For someone like you and the Salk Institute, and you study so much of this, you obviously know more than, than many of us when it comes to viruses, pandemics, epidemics. In your quiet time when you're with your team or with yourself and you see what is happening right now with what you know, are you concerned? Sure, I'm concerned. I mean, every, I think everybody, everybody's got to be concerned about it. I mean, people are dying um, and it's clear this virus is infectious. But in the long term, we're going to beat it. In the long term, we will come up with treatments for folks who are infected with the virus to try to make the disease that they have less severe. And eventually, we're also going to come up with a vaccine for the virus. I'm confident of that. When you say long-term, though, a lot of people are itching for that. What does that mean, long-term? Yeah, the, vac you know, the vaccine, you know, you can only rush this stuff so much. So, you know, even if, you, if everything worked perfectly, if everything worked as well as it's going to go, we're a year from a vaccine. Okay, that's if everything goes off. We have hiccups in that process in terms of how we try to make the vaccine, how we try to produce it, how we try to get it out to people. Then it's going to be longer than that. It'll be a year and a half, two years. I'm pretty confident, though. I would, you know, I'm guessing like everybody else at this point, but I'm pretty confident at this point we will have a vaccine by a two year time frame. I think that's not unreasonable. 
When you look at what the coronavirus is today in COVID-19 and you compare it to the epidemics and pandemics that have happened over the years and the, and the polios and, and whatnot, how is this different than what has happened in the past? And are we able to like better handle it? Do we have a better understanding of these viruses given what we learned back in, in the 20s that we can handle these better? Or are we just gonna see a repeat of what we've seen in the past? Well, we certainly know a lot more about viruses. We certainly know a lot more about the molecular biology of the viruses. Like in this particular virus, we basically know everything about it. We've sequenced its genome. We sequenced multiple isolates. So we know a lot about how the virus is evolving over time. We've sequenced it from China. We've sequenced it from Washington. We've sequenced it from California. We've sequenced it. We know the structure of all the proteins. So we know all of that. Um, so, no, we're much further ahead of that. But in terms of the public response, there are some similarities. I mean, the polio epidemics of the late 40s and 50s, the very worst one we had was in 1952. People were freaked out about polio back then. And public swimming pools in, in towns all across North America in the summertime were closed. Nobody went to them. So this thing about, you know, people knew it was an infectious virus. They knew what, what they were dealing with. And so... You know, they, they, you know it's, there was this thing about avoiding large crowds. But in terms of where we are in terms of the molecular biology of the virus, we're much, much faster. So in terms of try, making up trial vaccines, as soon as that genome of that virus was sequenced, there were companies, one of them here in San Diego, who were, make, who were auto, auto, right away had a platform, basically, to try to make a prototype vaccine against that virus. So we can move much faster than we could back then. The, the vaccine attempts, for example, um, against uh, polio, that, that, those took a decade to work. The, the fastest historical vaccine that we have in, in sort of you know, historical perspective is the mumps vaccine, which took us almost four years to make. So when I say two years, that would be faster than any vaccine that we've made so far. So we're moving, we're, we're in a better shape than we were back then. We're in better shape than we were back then, but we still have some time to go. We still have some time to go. The virus is still out there. It's much more widespread in the population than, than we know about from the case numbers, right? Because we haven't been testing very many people. Hardly anybody's been tested, right? You have to be sort of a desk door to get a, to get a coronavirus test. So the, the data that came out last week, for example, that here there have been two surveys of folks, one in Santa Clara County, one in Los Angeles County, where people just come in and volunteer and they give blood and they assay to see whether they have antibodies to the virus in their blood, which means they've been exposed to the virus. And the number of those people who, who test positive for those antibodies is somewhere between 20 and 50 times the caseload in those counties. I wouldn't be surprised if the level of infection in the population is 100 times the caseload, right? Because we haven't been testing nearly widely enough. This is one of the big problems we face right now is we're flying blind in terms of knowing. People are talking about, oh, we gotta reopen the economy, we gotta you know, reopen restaurants, we gotta get businesses back going. We're sort of flying blind when we propose to do this because we don't have the data. We don't know how widespread the virus really is. We don't know how many people have been infected. So, but if those antibody tests do prove to show that there's more people who have been exposed and, and were infected with this at, at some point, is that good news? It's good news from the standpoint that the virus is probably much less lethal than we thought originally, right? So, you know, when people talk about lethality, basically what they're doing is how many people die that were confirmed COVID people and how many people have been, have been diagnosed as having had the virus. The problem is most of the people who have the virus have never gotten a test. You know, if we look back in a, you know, what scientists love what's called a controlled situation, right? So for example, if you look back at the Diamond Princess cruise ship, where we, we knew all the passengers, all the passengers were tested, um, they all were assayed for whether they got sick, how sick did they get, did they die? 20% of the passengers in that cruise ship that were positive, tested positive by the PCR test for the novel coronavirus, never had any symptoms at all, right? So there are lots of folks walking around who have the virus and may be infectious. We actually don't know that. They may be infectious and they're never sick. They never get sick. So that's one of the issues. So 
you know, it's a long answer to your question, but one of the things we know, it's, I think it's, at some point it's a little bit encouraging because it, it's looking as though the virus is not as lethal as we thought it was, although obviously some folks have a terrible time with it and some folks die from it. So. Greg, That's, before we let you go, based on everything that you've studied and that you've known uh, in the past hundred years or so that um, you know we've we've seen as far as viruses go, if you had to guess how this is going to end up and when we're going to be out of this and what this is, what would be your educated what like what is your thought? Well, there's going to be much more move for testing over the next month to month and a half, so we know more data. Um, there's a possibility we will end up with some treatments. Um, you know, one of the things that we know a lot about these viruses, for example, we know how they copy their genome. So in order to make a new virus, you got to make a copy of the old gene, you got to make a copy of the old RNA. It has a specific enzyme that does this. And there are drugs that have already been tried with other viruses that need to use the same kind of enzyme. So there's one you may have heard about, it's called remdesivir, that people have been testing. So to answer your question, I think there will be treatments that will emerge in the next few months, sort of like Tamiflu for the flu. Tamiflu is not specific for any strain of flu, but it, it helps you to make your flu symptoms less if you come down with the flu. So I think we'll have some treatments, and I think we'll make progress on the vaccine. But as I said, you know, for a vaccine where everybody's going to get the vaccine, we have fully tested, it's rolled out, we produce it enough to, you know, a billion doses of the vaccine, that I think we're probably looking late to 2021. But that will be the ultimate thing. And then for sure we'll be done. <laughs> we'll be done until the next pandemic and epidemic. Until the next pandemic. So one of the things we had to think about is we got some guesses, okay? We got some guesses as to what the next pandemic virus might be. Okay. What we should be doing is trying to make vaccines against those viruses right now before anybody's infected. Well, we'll let uh, the professionals like you figure that out so we don't get in this situation again. Greg, we appreciate your time. Thank you. My pleasure. Take care. You've been listening to It Is What It Is with Shalzi. You can join in and ask your questions live during the podcasts on Shalzi's Facebook page. You can find so much more by following Shalzi Zomorodi on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and by visiting shalzi.com.